here we go. We're going to try to add a little bit to that knowledge and talk about ultrasound this morning. So first of all, proposition. Uh, why is it important to know proposition? That was one of my questions I put out uh, for the flip classroom. Any thoughts on that? Why that's important? I would say if you don't know where your proposition is, you can't tell where the macula is, for example, in these two. And say you had like an RD or something like that. Um, and then when you're characterizing a lesion, you've got to know the dimensions of the lesion in which direction. Okay. Um, so. All right, very good. And to be systematic, just like when you do indirect ophthalmoscopy, you know, you just, you wouldn't just look at one thing with the indirect. And if you had a retinal tear, you certainly want to focus on that, but you also want to look at the entire fundus. So the same thing with the ultrasound, you need to have a systematic approach where you put the probe and uh, look at the entire globe. So this probe position here on the left, uh, there's two major positions that I use. I use a, a transverse and longitudinal. Which one would this be? Anybody know what proposition this is? The marker is here, and the probe is placed here against the eye. I think it's transverse. Right, that's transverse, and this is longitudinal. And the basis for that is uh, the way the transducer moves. My screen advancing. You might have to click the arrow on the bottom left. Okay. Some, all right. All right. Uh, all right. So then the other one on the right. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. This is the transducer here with the, uh, the head removed. And this shows the actual transducer that generates the ultrasound. So there's a little real thin crystal. It's a ceramic crystal, uh, very, very um, microscopically thin. And that's stimulated by electric pulses to uh, vibrate and it generates sound waves and very, very high frequency, obviously. So uh, our standard B-scan probe uh, is a eight megahertz probe uh, or 10 megahertz, eight to 10. And uh, that generates the sound, but this thing goes back and forth. It uh, oscillates side to side. So that oscillation here in the example on the, on the uh, actual probe against the eye with a white mark, that tells you which ways the transducer is oscillating. So let's say the white mark is here on the transducer, and this would be it here. It is going back and forth uh, in a in a in a uh, parallel plane to the limbus. So the limbus is here. That transducer here in the slide, of course, is two dimensional, but three dimensionally, that would be coming out of the slide and back into it, you know, towards you and back. So that's transverse. Longitudinal, you rotate the probe so that the white mark is superior. And then the, uh, the sound beam is generated, um, again, going back this time up and down. So the sound wave here is actually showing the fundus in a uh, horizontal, you know, side to side kind of direction. Whereas here it's showing an anterior to posterior direction. And usually if you wanna look at peripheral lesions, it's important to get the, uh, uh, the longitudinal position. It actually shows, you can get further out with the longitudinal position than with transfers. So that's all, you know, it's academic perhaps sounding, but really there's a practical application to that. And basically when you look at a lesion, example, here's a, here's a choroidal lesion, probably a melanoma. So this is a transfer position here. So the sound beam is going side to side. So you're actually measuring that dimension of a lesion, you know, in a horizontal or side to side dimension. And here's the lesion here displayed on the screen. Now also the proposition, the white, the mark on the probe, whether it's white or other marks, uh, that orients it. So then when it's displayed on the screen, that is up on the screen. So if you're the, the probe here or the white mark is here going, let's say it's pointing uh, uh, you know, to the side here. Uh, when you show it on the screen, it actually displays it uh, in the superior part of the, of the screen. So just remember that when you're looking at lesions, that, that mark on the probe orients you as to which way is up on the screen. And then here is the longitudinal position of the same lesion. So the dimensions are a little different. So when you wanna characterize a lesion, you wanna characterize it both uh, in a horizontal direction and a vertical direction. 
And that's important, you know, first of all, for size of the lesion. If you had a really weird lesion, really elliptically shaped, if you just measured it in one dimension, you would get probably a falsely low dimension compared to the other dimension where you would get a longer dimension. So those two together are how you characterize a lesion. And besides just for following a lesion to know uh, consistently when you look at the lesion again, um, be able to compare those measurements. Uh, also, when you start treating these lesions, you know, Eric Hansen here is, is doing that with plaques. So you fabricate a radioactive iodine plaque and you sew it to the back of the eye and leave it there for three to five days to kill the tumor. To make that plaque, you need to know those dimensions. So it's a very practical application of those, of those uh, positions. So again, proposition is important to be systematic. I used to teach a course at the Academy, American Academy, and one of my uh, co-teachers, Dr. Ron Green, talked about the smear technique where residents and fellows tended to stick the probe on the eye and they're excited to see a lesion and that's where they focus it. But again, you can miss things that way just by sticking the probe there and not really being systematic and going, exploring the whole globe. Again, just analogous to uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy where you want to look at the whole fundus and you might miss a tear, you might have two tears instead of one, or you might have a lesion that you didn't know about. So uh, again, to being systematic is important. Is that sort of clear? Do people understand that? Any, any questions? Feel free to uh, ask a question if you don't understand it. Okay, this is a, uh, a obviously a membrane in the fundus. And the question is, how do you determine if this is a choroidal detachment or a retinal detachment? Any thoughts on this? Uh, I usually have the, especially if the patient's hopefully awake and able to move their eyes, uh, you can see how the uh, retinal detachment sometimes is more bolus and will move, whereas a choroidal won't um, move as much. Okay, that's good. So move, move that, kinetics, that's important. I think choroidals often, uh, they're attached to the vortex veins as well. So there's a little bit of a limit there. Right. That's why you get this kind of a scalloping or kind of a convex shape, like here, this right lower. This shows kind of a typical choroidal. And as you said, it looks like that because it attaches to the vortex veins. They tether it so that it can't extend beyond that, whereas redness a retina is not limited to that. So you get this kind of a scalloping uh, concave appearance, uh, convex appearance. Um, so again, mobility, you know, they tend to be more rigid. They're kind of fixed because they're tethered down by the vortex. They don't uh, move as much. Um, they tend to have the scallop appearance. That's kind of a classic choroidal. But if you're not sure, sometimes it's not so obvious, you know, a case like here is, is obvious, but sometimes they can be more low-lying choroidal or retinas can be more bolus, almost kind of this convex uh, shape. A scan can be helpful because when you do the A scan, here's that surface on the A scan. This is a choroidal here. You get kind of this double peak. And the reason is double peak because you have both retina and choroid contained in this surface. Whereas a retina, you just have a single peak because, because it's only a retina, the choroid would still be attached. So this is helpful to see the double peak if you're not sure what a surface is, if it's a choroidal or a retinal detachment. And here's another example. So, and usually choroidals don't come right off the optic disc. Just look at the anatomy of the globe and the way the choroid, uh, the optic nerve comes into the eye and the choroid starts here. So it really can't extend right off the disc like the retina does. So if you see a shape like this, again, that's consistent with choroidals. And here's that scalloped appearance more peripherally. But as you get towards the disc, you get this uh, 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 not directly off the disc. Now, here's another example here. This is a kind of a low-lying choroidal, and this could be confused. Uh, see, this isn't that scalloped appearance. It's not the uh, convex appearance. So this here could be thought to be possibly you know, a retina. It could be retina or choroid. So that's, again, the A scan is helpful to do that, uh, look for that double peak. And if you see that, that pretty well nails it. It's a choroidal detachment. This is a case I just saw recently, and this is using an immersion technique where you can sort of see the whole globe. And actually, the cornea is up here, didn't quite get it on the slide, but again, the scalloping appearance consistent with choroidals and all the stuff under the choroid here is, is hemorrhage. This is a hemorrhagic choroidal 
Uh, here's a post-surgical uh, patient, post-glaucoma uh, procedure. And you see the kind of this appearance all the way uh, around the globe. And here's the optic nerve is back here, so it doesn't quite go up to the nerve. Now, again, with this immersion technique, I, I can get a better gestalt of the whole eye. I like to do that a lot when I have these, these cases where you want to kind of visualize the whole globe. And this is the corneas here. Here's iris, lens up here. And here it's kissing. So it wasn't obvious on the initial exam when you did the initial uh, B scan just to the posterior segment. It appeared to be like the choroidals were kind of maybe moderate. They weren't really touching in the middle. But here more nasally, you can see that they actually are touching. They're adherent. And that's important because if you have adherence of the uh, surface of the retina uh, to each other, that can become permanent. You get fibrotic changes and things. So that would be a reason to consider drainage uh, sooner than later in a case like this. So you know, maybe watch it for a couple of days or so, but if it wasn't changing, that would be a reason to consider drainage of the, of the choroidal. And again, stop me along the way. If you have any questions at all, feel free to, don't feel like, don't be embarrassed to ask the questions, you know, basic concepts and things that uh, sometimes aren't so obvious. I mean, I've, I've done this so long, it's just, you know, obvious to me, but certainly not, not to you. Dr. Harry, I got questions. Yes. Uh, sorry, this is Tyler. Um, okay. Maybe you had covered it a, a little bit, but in, in our exam, we're always taught to like, as you said, follow that systematic approach. Um, do you go from structure to structure each time? Or do you, if you have a set um, set steps that you go through in evaluating the whole globe? Or do you focus in on one area that has been previously identified? Or, or how do you do that? That's a good question. And I, I usually do the whole globe. You know, I, I've done this again enough. I just do it rapidly. I just kind of really do a fast globe screen. But I always like to look at the whole globe because I've, I've had a number of cases where I found something else. You know, there wasn't the patient presented for, you know, either a lesion or a tear or something. But I, in scanning the globe, I find something else. I find another tear or I find another lesion. So here, I, let's go back to the uh, transverse approach. <laughs> I usually start with this. So I put the probe right against the limbus. I just kind of rotate the probe and like a fulcrum, I just kind of move it along the globe going from front to back. So if you think of the sound beam, if you, if you put the probe uh, right here and if you kind of move it, you kind of you sweep that sound beam going across the globe. And if you sweep it both ways, you kind of put it back here towards the disc, then move it more, um, more uh, anteriorly towards the limbus and towards the pars plana, I'm sorry. So you wanna sweep the glow with that sound beam. Each, each sector of the, of the B scan covers about 60 degrees. So when you sweep the globe, you're covering 60 degrees. So if you think you know, the globe of 360 degrees, you'd wanna do six different quadrants. So you would start, I would start in Fairley, maybe start at six o'clock, go around to you know, four o'clock, around to uh, uh, two o'clock, and just wanna do that so that you're covering the entire globe as you're moving the probe. I usually do transverse. If I want to get real peripheral, then I'll rotate it. And I'll do longitudinal with the same thing, kind of moving the, the probe along the eye. And so you want to cover the entire globe. Does that kind of answer your question? Dr. Harry, do you ever have the patient look in different directions? Because I remember back in Germany when I was doing ultrasounds, we were um, instructed to have the patient kind of look straight, do what you just explained, and then have the patient look up, like with the eyelid closed, of course, look up, look down, look right, look left, uh, just to get all the different eccentric, uh, uh, eccentricities. Do you, would you recommend that or would you not recommend that? Yes, yes, I do, Lydia. Yes, uh, I usually have the patient look up, look down, look left, look right. So, because if, sometimes you get peripheral lesions that you would miss unless you do that. So, uh, that's a good point that I have the patient looking in different directions. Now, obviously, if it's an under anesthesia with a child or something, then you can't do that. But in fact, I had a case one time that was interesting. It was uh, just by looking straight back at the eye, uh, you, you miss the lesion, but by having looking real peripherally, uh, you could pick up the lesion. So by actually, actually put a cotton tip on the eye and kind of, kind of moved it so we could get more peripheral. So uh, yeah, that's important to do that. So again, 
whatever system you want to use, but to do it, you know, consistently to kind of do the same thing every time you approach the eye and you'll, again, you'll find things that otherwise would have been missed. Any more questions on that on proposition? Okay, the concept of a PVD versus a detached retina. Any thoughts on determining that? Like this, this case here, is this an RD or a PVD? You think? It looks like a retinal attachment, seeing that it's coming from the optic nerve and uh, going to the um, aura. Right, it does. And, uh, you know, high reflectivity, it's, you know, it's kind of a dense membrane, high reflective membrane comes off the disc. But in this case, it isn't, actually, it was a PVD. This is a longstanding, it was a diabetic, and oftentimes if you have vitreous hemorrhage, it'll deposit on the posterior hyaloid face, and it can make it denser, thicker. And it can look like an RD. These can these can deceive you sometimes. But one clue here was the way it comes off the disc. Even though it attaches at the disc, it kind of has this the the leaves or the of the membrane come together. Whereas in an RD, they're kind of separate. Like they come, there's a little gap between them. Um, where this is almost like a stalk, where it sort of comes off. Does that kind of make sense? This is this is kind of attaching to the disc here as one unit. Whereas here it's like a separate unit. There's one here and there's one here. So it's a subtle kind of difference, but that again, that can be a clue. But I agree, if I looked at this initially, he just showed me a picture of this, I'd say, yeah, probably RD, but it turned out actually to be a, just a, a, a PVD that had a lot of you know hyloid, uh, uh, dense hyloid because of vitreous hemorrhage. So. Yeah, Dr. Harry, I've seen um, PVDs, especially you know in trauma settings where there's vitreous hemorrhage where just like you said, the hemorrhage will just adhere, especially in a young patient to the hyaloid and it really looks convincing. And then again, if you can have the patient kind of look uh, in different directions, um, then the, uh, the lines that look really, really thick or the contours, they kind of just start to disintegrate a little bit in, in the movement because you can see that it's more blood, but they can, they can really, really be very convincing for an RD. All right, exactly. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That again, it can be hard to tell sometimes, even when you've had a lot of experience. So, uh, a membrane that attaches to the disc is usually an RD, but not always. And a membrane that doesn't attach to the disc is usually not an RD, but not always. So, it's always those exceptions that that uh, get you. But you know, generally, again, zebras and hoofbeats and horses, you sort of go what's with you know. So, you usually you could you'd really suspect this as an RD and it would be that until proven otherwise. So everything else you would do to try to, to disprove it, but uh, they can be deceptive sometimes. And this is more of an example here. So this shows an RD here. So it's a denser membrane attaches right at the disc. And again, the way it attaches, is not like a single unit stock. It's more like two separate leaves coming out of the disc this way. And here's a PVD uh, also the same in the same eye. So. PVD, but again, it's kind of dense, you know, there's probably hemorrhage on this. So it's a denser posterior hyloid. Um, so these two surfaces, so you can, this doesn't, this does not attach to the disc, whereas this one does. So you can kind of separate them out that way. And again, the A scan can be helpful because um, reflectivity of the A scan, usually with the retina, is going to be very high. It's going to be almost as high as the initial signal. You get the initial signal here from the front of the eye, and here's a sclera. So this membrane here should be pretty close to the height of those surfaces. Whereas a vitreous detachment, even though it's a dense uh, posterior hyloid here, it isn't as high on the A scan. So I use the A scan a lot to sort of help separate out the membranes. But again, there's always exceptions. I've had dense you know, PVDs, a dense hyloid, posterior hyloids that looked high on this. So it's helpful. You, you kind of put clues together. You kind of gather these clues and sort of try to put them all together and kind of help you decide. Let's see if I have, here's another one. Uh, this shows uh, a, a, a surface here. Now this obviously is kind of a less dense surface. So again, you're really thinking PVD in this situation and the A scan. Um, this, okay. The A scan shows the membrane here, but again, it's not very high. So this is that same membrane here. 
And so the height of it really is a clue that this is not a retina detachment. Um, so generally, if a membrane isn't as high as these other spikes, it almost is never retina. But occasionally, a real high spike can still be a PVD. So that, that's helpful. But again, it's a, it's a clue that you kind of put in the hopper. Now, again, sometimes you get vitreous membranes, too, that it's not an, you kind of rule out a PVD or not. You see these membranes, it can be vitreous cineresis. You know, as you age, the vitreous uh, has changes in, a, in the uh, matrix of the vitreous. And you get these little uh, pockets of fluid and things that can look like a PVD. But a real clue is the Weiss ring. And I always stress that when I teach, you know, I teach residents about ultrasound, you look for the Weiss ring and you can see that too when you look with the uh, 90 diopter or even the direct ophthalmoscope. But here on the, on the ultrasound, it's kind of a double ring to it because you have like it's a, it's a circle because it comes off the optic disc where it detaches from the disc. You get this kind of a double surface. And if you look for the Weiss ring and see that, then you know it's a PVD, That's, that, that, that nails that diagnosis. Now here's a uh, mobility picture. So this shows again that here's the PVD surface here. And just see how mobile that is as a patient moves their eye. It really just kind of flaps around in the breeze. Let's show that again. This is hemorrhage. All this other stuff here is hemorrhage. But this membrane here is really quite mobile and just really kind of just easily moves and uh, without a lot of tethering to it. And here's a little tumor, probably a small melanoma, but there's a detached retina over it and there's some vitreous hemorrhage out here. But again, watch the mobility of this surface. This is a stiffer kind of movement compared to the vitreous, which is kind of more fluid, you know, more easily mobile. So you see that just kind of that adjunct a string or a rope that you kind of tie to a tree and you know, twang it. It sort of has that tautness to it. I'll show that one more time here. So just watch this, it's kind of that just memory just kind of, you know, vibrates in place like it's tethered down, like it's held by something. Whereas the vitreous is just flowing freely here, just moving very easily. So that's, that's a good contrast in the, in the difference of the mobility of these two membranes. Here's another one, here's a dense membrane, again, attaching the disc. And again, look at how it attaches. It doesn't have that single unit stock. It has these two leaves coming off, kind of spread from each other. That is more consistent with their detached retina. And here's vitreous hemorrhage. You see that stiffness to it, that tautness where it just, you know, it's just a stiffer membrane. It's less fluid, less mobile than the, uh, the vitreous hemorrhage or the vitreous detachment. So mobility is very helpful, and I use that a lot. I just don't have the patient make little movements uh, of the eye to kind of help pin that down. So those are all clues. You know, it's, again, it's not always 100%. I've had cases where I was wrong. I, I called it an RD, and it turned out to be uh, vitreous. So uh, we just try to do the best we can and try to put everything together. But most of the time, you're, if you do these things, it's, you're going to be right. But I know in the past, residents get called to the ER a lot, like middle of the night, and the ER doc says they got a detached retina because they do their ultrasounds down there. Ends up being a PVD in many cases. So again, you know, it's, it can, the, thing, the things that seem obvious sometimes aren't so obvious. So that's why it's good to, to know these little tricks. All right, is that sort of clear about membranes and retina versus vitreous? Any questions on that? Yeah, thanks. The videos are really helpful. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mobility really helps. Okay, so Nevi. See a lot of these. You all see them in your in your practice, you know. And when to worry about them, when to not to worry about them, when to get an ultrasound, and when not to. So the Shields criteria um, for a suspicious nevus to, you know, you worry about becoming a melanoma or metastasizing and growing. What are some of those criteria? You can kind of shout them out, anybody that wants to. Thicker than two millimeter. Okay. And you wouldn't know that unless you did ultrasound. So, you know, you can sort of guess elevation by looking, but it's really not that reliable. So ultrasound is helpful there. Subretinal fluid. What's that? Subretinal fluid. Okay, so retinal fluid, right. Uh -huh. And again, sometimes, you know, you can tell on the 
exam, but sometimes again, ultrasound can be helpful there. So thickness, subretinal fluid, and else? Lipofusion, lack of drusen, okay, distance so, from nerve, evolution over time. Right, so orange pigment, lipofusion pigment. And that's, Symptoms. That's different than a dru and drusen. If you have drusen, actually, it's a good thing because drusen are more a sign of chronicity, usually a less actively growing lesion, whereas lack of drusen can be a sign of more rapid growth. And this orange pigment, again, is different than drusen. So that is a risk factor. So we talked about thickness, we talked about um, uh, orange pigment, subretinal fluid. So clinically- Lowness on ultrasound, like the low reflectivity on right, ultrasound. Right, right, exactly. And we'll talk, we'll talk a bit more about that too. So um, subretinal fluid. So what, what is the clinical consequence of subretinal fluid? If, if a patient came in and saw you, what would he say? He wouldn't say, I got subretinal fluid. What would he say to you when he was complaining about something wrong? What would be a symptom of subretinal fluid? Visual distortion. Yeah, some kind of visual distortion. You see a shape or uh, something funny off to the side or something. So, you know, clinically, subretinal fluid it'll, uh, uh, translates to symptomatic, you know, patient complaining about uh, visual distortion. Uh, somebody mentioned the optic disc proximity. Did, was that somebody said that about how close it is to the optic disc? Yes. Right. With myself. Right. Is that Brandon? Uh, yeah. Sorry. So, within what, how close to the disc are you worried about? Uh, if I remember, I think it's three millimeters, maybe. A couple of disc diopters. A couple of disc diopters. And that's about three millimeters because it's 1.5 millimeters for the optic disc usually. So yeah, so within two millimeters, so that's a risk factor. And again, and, and why is that a risk factor? It's just statistical. They just took a bunch of patients, <clears throat> the ones that had lesions closer to the disc, <clears throat> over time tended to do worse as far as uh, growth and metastases. Okay. So those are the kind of the major Shields criteria that I learned, you know, just over a long, long time ago, but they've actually added a couple. So we get thickness we talked about, so about the fluid symptoms because of the fluid, orange pigment, margin with three millimeters. Now hollowness, ultrasonographic hollowness. Anybody know what that means? On your A scan, you're gonna have a lower uh, spike basically. Okay, <clears throat> actually it's more of a B scan finding, but also it correlates to the A scan. And usually it's gonna be a bigger lesion, usually a smaller lesion, you're not gonna see that, but a larger lesion, usually a, you know, four to five millimeters or greater. So here's a mushrooming tumor here. And as you go through the lesion towards the base, it is less echo dense than it is. Uh, so right here, there's echo lucency, which means it's darker. Here it's wider, it means it's denser. And here's the A-scan correlate. Here's the lesion on A-scan. Here's the surface. Here's the sclera. So initially, when you start out, it's kind of higher here. But as you go through it, it gets lower. That's due to sound absorption. The sound beam, as it goes through the lesion, is absorbed by the tissue, reflected, refracted, absorbed. So you lose energy. So as you get towards the base, it becomes kind of a more hollow appearance. And both here's the B-scan, here's the A-scan. It's not all that helpful, really. I mean, it's just kind of inherent. Obviously, the lesion like this, that's going to be a melanoma. So how long is really there to me just doesn't mean much. I mean, it says there, that's nice, but it's not really, to me, a real helpful finding. And usually it's going to be a bigger lesion that you already kind of know it's a melanoma. So the smaller lesions, I just don't see that. They also talk about the halo sign. Anybody ever heard of that or know what that even is even about? Now, it's not very common. Here's actually an example of it. So here's the nevus here. Here's the darker area. There's kind of this whitish yellowish rim around it, kind of like a halo. So it's a pretty rare finding, but uh, in fact, I looked it up. It's about 5% of nevi have this finding. So it's really not very common. Most of them don't have this, but if they have it, there seems to be a protective finding. The ones that have a halo sign have less of a chance of growth and metastasis. And it may be due to the immune response. This may be the body's immune system causing this rim around it. We're not quite sure, 
and that's the halo sign. So if you hear that, that word again, that not super helpful because it's so rare. It's like 5% you know, of nearby are going to have this. So if you see it, great, you feel more comfortable. But if you don't see it, it doesn't mean a whole lot to me because it's just a rare finding. So those are the shields criteria. So it's just, I think these, the first five are the most important to remember the thickness, subretinal fluid symptoms, pigmented margin within the, within the disc. But for, I guess, board questions, you probably at least should be aware of hollowness, halo, and absence of drusen. Now we see a lot of lesions. I think we talked about this in rounds a couple of weeks ago, I think with Lydia, uh, her FLEO project to look at the long term FLEO and sort of help characterize. Cause we see you know, a nevus is usually fairly obvious. It's a you know, small dark lesion, it's not that elevated. You feel pretty comfortable. But you get these lesions here with the risk factors. Again, you wanna look at these things clinically, you know, thickness and, fl and fluid pigment, but is this a nevus? Is it a melanoma? So sometimes even pathologically, it's not that clear. Years ago, these eyes were often enucleated. When I was at my residency and fellowship, uh, nucleation was pretty much a standard approach to eye lesions. And a lot of eyes were taken out that didn't need to be taken out. They were 20-20 eyes and they had a peripheral lesion. Ended up not being a melanoma, being some benign lesion. So it really, it was about 20% of the time we were wrong. So Clinically, just looking at lesions is hard to tell. But when a nevus starts to change to a melanoma uh, is the question. So Shields coined the term nevoma. So it's kind of kind of the word nevus along with melanoma and calling the nevoma, where you have kind of characteristics that aren't not typical of, of a nevus, but yet not really full-blown melanoma. So it's that kind of transition zone. And that's where FLEO hopefully will help us kind of looking for the you know, fluorescent patterns and things to sort of better characterize that. But there are ultrasound findings too that are helpful with that. So and we'll talk a bit more about that. So risk factors for melanomas for nevi. So if there are no risk factors on that list that we showed, there's less than a 3% chance of that becoming a melanoma of growing or metastasizing. So you're really pretty safe just to watch these. One risk factor, you know, it goes up 38% of growth or metastasis. So you want to watch those more carefully. So if you saw a risk factor, I would recommend the patient come back probably within three months and look at them again. And uh, most of the time, they're just going to be stable and sit there, even with a risk factor. Most of these aren't going to really uh, do much. But you get three or more risk factors, 50% chance. So certainly that's more concerning and Eric Hansen referral and, you know, possibly treatment at that point. So those are the kind of the correlation. So any questions about that? Nevi, risk factors? Okay, go to another one. So pathology, aha, uh -huh. that's why I really first was, was attracted to ultrasound because of the correlation, especially the A scan, even though the A scan, like all these funny looking lines that don't mean too much, it really correlates well to pathology. And we'll talk more about that. So um, based on this A scan, so here's the surface of a lesion here. Here's the sclera. So the lesion's actually in here. And here it is on B scan. Any thoughts on the pathology of this? And again, you don't have to name the lesion. You just have to sort of tell me what you'd expect pathologically. Why are all these, why are the spikes, why are they high? Why are they kind of regular? What kind of lesion could do that? So <sighs> regular high internal reflectivity for this lesion, I'd expect um, there, it would be pretty heterogeneous uh, consistently throughout the lesion to cause the high spikes that stay level throughout the whole lesion. Um, and on the bottom on the B scan, you can see that the lesion looks pretty reflective or um, diffuse also in the choroid. I'd be suspicious for like a choroidal uh, hemangioma. Okay, very good and very well summarized as far as the pathology. Exactly right. So hemangiomas have a lot of interfaces because of all these little cavernous spaces are full of blood. Uh, what happens, the sound beam 
you know, it hits the lesion and it starts to go through one of these little spaces and it starts to get low because this is more homogeneous. And then it hits an interface between the two uh, little cells, uh, blood, blood cells, uh, and then it, it goes high because it's an interface. So sound reflection is based on interface difference. So if you have an interface of one sound velocity versus another, you get an interface that causes the reflection to go higher. So you kind of get this up and down. So it's a little bit low there, high there, low there. So this kind of monotonous seesaw kind of appearance and that correlates pathologically to a lesion with a lot of interfaces, very irregular uh, interfaces. So again, just in terms of pathology, there's a direct correlation. And the same applies to like orbital lesions like cavernous hemangiomas. That's just a bigger version of this. They tend to be um, you know, high reflective, kind of this regular kind of seesaw up and down kind of pattern. And the B scan, as you said, it is a little bit brighter and that, so the grayscale uh, is helpful, but again, it can be a hard, you know, grayscale can be uh, for us to interpret that with our, the human eye and our brain to really sort that out as to that versus an, another lesion. But A is kind of really kind of just amplifies it. It's like, you know, taking, taking something, just expanding to just taking those pinpoints of pixels on the B scan brightness and making lines out of them. And we can see lines better than we can see bright dots sometimes to correlate contrast. So you get this high reflectivity on this lesion. So is that sort of clear? People understand that concept? And it's really helpful because I've had a number of lesions sent to me that were thought to be melanomas and ended up the reflectivity just, and it surprised me too. Sometimes, you know, they're just, uh, I expected melanoma and I saw this and it just, that, that is not a melanoma. If I see that, I just, it can't be a melanoma. All right, here's another lesion. So reflectivity here, here's the lesion here. Here's a sclera, here's internally. So reflectivity here, and here's the B-scan correlate. So pathologically, what are you thinking here in this lesion? Yeah, for, for this one, um, it has a uh, fairly low internal reflectivity also with kind of a classic decrescendo appearance after the initial uh, lesion spike. And then on the ultrasound image, it also looks like there's maybe like subretinal fluid or at least a retinal detachment adjacent to the lesion. So I'd definitely be more concerned for a melanoma in this case. All right, exactly. Very good. And pathologically, <clears throat> melanomas tend to be really just dense cell populations, just a lot of cells growing together. A few interfaces, you have, you know, blood vessels and a, a couple of, you know, just other kinds of fibrotic interfaces, but usually it's a pretty uniform, homogeneous cell pattern. And on ultrasound, homogeneity usually refers to low reflectivity. So on the A scan, it's low. Here's a vitreous, which is homogeneous usually and low. So you get a flat baseline here. Here's melanoma inside the tumor. And again, you get a lot of cells crammed together, few interfaces, so low reflectivity. And again, the B scan, the darkness here correlates to low reflectivity and the brightness corresponds to, uh, to you know, more reflectivity. And again, you could be fooled here. If you looked at this only without the subretinal fluid and other things, that lesion compared to the brightness of this lesion, the grayscale is just kind of, you know, it's not all that helpful. So, but where the A scan again, it just kind of just expands that. It just takes these dots of pixels and just makes lines out of them. And you can see the lines better. This is low, that's obviously low on the A scan. So uh, low reflectivity, certainly in a fundus lesion, you start thinking about a more homogeneous lesion and certainly like a melanoma. Okay. Another lesion here. So here's the lesion here. Here's the surface. Here's the sclera. Internally, you see kind of a low area. There's a high area, kind of up and down, heterogeneous. Here's the B scan. Any thoughts on this pathologically? So, you know, based on our last discussion, so if a low area, what do you think when you see low? On a on a lesion pathologically, what does low usually correlate to on pathology? Something that's homogeneous, yeah, very right. cellular. Yes, homogeneous, crammed together. Whereas high or kind of up and down, more heterogeneous. Um, 
yeah heterogeneous or right. vascularity right exactly that's what you predict you know you predict a lesion pathologically it's going to have kind of different you know, different parts of it. it'll have different uh, characteristics on the ultrasound and that's exactly what you see on this lesion here so here's the lesion here's you know cells growing together and they're kind of branching out kind of invading the choroid so here's the lesion here's the fundus photo so diagnostically what do you think this is this could be suspicious for like a metastasis yeah exactly right this is a breast cancer so again they tend to be more heterogeneous now occasionally if you look at the lesion you'll see consistently a low area so you start thinking melanoma but if you look at the whole lesion you have to scan the whole lesion and not just take one section you'll see heterogeneity you'll see different parts of it as up and down so again that's very helpful just to you know make that correlation with a metastatic lesion now, occasionally a subretinal hemorrhage can look like this. You get an initial discoform lesion with you know, acute bleeding. Uh, they can be kind of heterogeneous because you're going to have some blood pockets, you have fibrous tissue. So when I see this, I don't just call it metastatic, you know, immediately. I'll say, well, suspicious, you know, watch, let's get him back in a few weeks and recheck it. And usually a subretinal hemorrhage, like a discoform, is going to get smaller as a blood sort of absorbs or consolidates. Uh, this will get smaller, get a bit more homogeneous than this, whereas metastatic lesions will be the same or even bigger as you follow them. So again, following the lesion, have them come back and repeat it could be helpful. Okay, lesion here. Uh, here's the uh, A scan, high reflectivity here. Here's the B scan. Here's a fundus photo. Any thoughts on this? That's very high reflective. That's really, you know, just much more than you normally see in a reflectivity in a lesion. Maybe something very dense, like osteoma. Uh -huh. Choroidal osteoma with the shadowing. Uh -huh. Exactly. B scan. That's calcium. You see that? This, you know, calcium is just real, very bright. It shadows out the tissue behind it because the calcium just absorbs the ultrasound, bounce, bounces back off of it like a mirror reflects it. And then the A scan is very high, just a spike that just jumps out at you. So this is a osseous chorostoma or choroidal osteoma. And this is kind of the yellowish, kind of diffuse kind of lesion, usually more women, kind of 20 ish to 50 ish age group. Um, And here's a pathology showing the calcium. So that's a osteoma. And there's a famous case we'll talk about later that came out of this institution before it was ever Moran. So of all we've talked about and we've learned, so here's a lesion here, here's the fundus picture optos, kind of a dark this lesion here. Here's the B scan, kind of looking like a mushroom. Here's the A scan. So reflectivity, so here's the surface of the lesion, here's sclera. So what's the reflectivity here? Is that high, low? How would you characterize that? Pretty high. Yeah, pretty high. Yes, hear me, I maybe talk to me here, so maybe hollowness, here's some shadowing here, here's kind of loss of energy here. So is this a melanoma? This is a tough question. I'd be surprised if anybody got, got the answer to this, because I didn't. When I first saw this, I thought it was melanoma for sure. It was sent to me by an outside retina doctor as a melanoma, just based on the darkness and the B-scan mushroom being characteristic. But the A scan, I just, I couldn't call it melanoma based on this. I said, it's just not typical for melanoma. I just haven't seen one this high reflective. Was there any vascularity or flickering on B scan? Uh, minimal, minimal, that's a good question. Minimal vascularity. And that's an important criteria that I used to. So I really, I really was against melanoma. Well, 
this lesion was enucleated, and this is a pathology. So it was very, very dark. There's kind of these little pseudocysts within the lesion. And that's what caused the reflectivity because you have these pseudocysts. It's, a lot of, it's kind of like the hemangioma, a lot of interfaces to reflect sound. So you get high reflectivity bouncing back from these interfaces. You don't get this real homogeneous, consistent cellular lesion like a melanoma. This is a melanocytoma. And they, you know, this is a big one. Most of them are small. They come off the optic disc. They're just very, very dark. They're usually pretty obvious, but sometimes they can be more peripheral and they can get pretty big. And metastatic risk is very low with these, but still they can get big enough to start causing a lot of problems, you know, a lot of morbidity of the globe. So this eye, again, is enucleated. But this is an interesting case that we're trying to get published in one of our like, clinical challenges. But again, the point of all this is reflectivity is very helpful. When you see this, it's just, this is not typical for melanoma. It just, you know, that to me, maybe really think about other differential uh, lesions. All right, differential diagnosis. We talked about all these, hemangiomas, metastatic, discoform, nevus, and osteoma. So again, there were two major AFIP, Armed Forces Institute of Pathology studies, done, I think, in the 60s and the 70s, repeated. And a lot of eyes were sent to pathology because a lot of eyes were taken out, thought to be tumors, and 20% had were false positive. And that's, you know, it's not very good. I mean, if you're talking a fifth of the eyes you're nucleating, I mean, that's, you know, taking a patient that had some vision, sometimes 20-20, and taking all their sight away in that eye, and it's a benign lesion, that's, that's not good form, you know, certainly not practice attorney's dream. But in those years, it was standard of care. So, you know, it's just something that we did, but because you're so afraid about melanomas and growth and metastatic risk. But these are, these are lesions that were in that path series. And these are pathological uh, uh, case studies showing what lesions were confused with melanomas. So suspicious nevus that you kind of expect that that's a nevoma concept and Maybe that wasn't so bad to take those out because they could have been melanomas growing and transforming. But discoform lesions, uh, central discoform peripheral, RPE hypertrophy, hemangiomas, reactive RPE hyperplasia, melanocytomas, choroidals, retinal detachment, vitreous, the posterior scleritis. So these are all eyes removed and nucleated because of the thought of melanoma. So we're a lot better nowadays. The collaborative ocular melanoma study done, what, 15 years ago or so, uh, accuracy rates, you know, real high, 99% plus. So we come a long way with our diagnostic capabilities. So echographic criteria, these are kind of the criteria that I go by, and most of these are kind of A-scan criteria. Internal structure is regular, reflectivity low to medium, consistency solid, Vascularity, fast, spontaneous, shape, mushroom, or collar button. If I see all of these, that's just almost always pathic mnemonic for melanoma. If I see, you know, a couple of them and the other ones, then it's just less of a slam dunk, but again, usually melanoma. And here's examples of those criteria. So here's, here's the lesion here. Here's the sclera internally. So this reflectivity here, you know, it's sort of regular. You sort of talk yourself into that. If you drew a line across here, it's not real high, not real low, kind of this mid-range reflect. It's not here at the bottom. It's not here at the top. It's kind of in that middle. Here's another example, kind of the same. Another example. So these are kind of consistent. These are all the reflectivity patterns. And it says solid consistency. That means the surface is pretty steady. Sometimes when you do this, I didn't have an example of this. I couldn't find one to show you, but this spike here doesn't move much. If you get the probe perpendicular and you see the spike here, it's pretty steady. It's not just shaking like a vitreous membrane, but just kind of shimmer and shake and go up and down. This is a pretty solid surface. It's not moving much. Then once you're inside the lesion, you look for this consistency, reflectivity, kind of medium to low, kind of regular. These are all examples of melanomas here that meet those criteria. Vascularity, if you look inside this lesion, you see this little flickering, this rapid flicker, 
show that again. See how it just flickers, it just jiggles and moves. That's vascularity, that's spontaneous vascularity. And that's pretty rare with other kinds of lesions. Uh, occasionally metastatic lesions like metastatic lung will look kind of like that. But usually if you see that kind of vascularity, that's very consistent with melanoma. So here's a subretinal fluid here, here's the tumor. Here's a real small lesion. And usually a small lesion is hard to tell vascularity because they're just you know, so flat, it's really hard to pick it up. But this shows, you can see the flicker here, and this is the same lesion magnified. See that rapid flicker? Just see it just kind of flickering within that, just kind of a rapid oscillation. So that's vascularity. So that's another important characteristic to look for. And, and I can see it with A scan when it's real vascular, but it's much more obvious on the B scan. So that's something to always look for. Okay, mushrooming. So what does mushrooming refer to? Why, why does the tumor look like that? Why is it like a mushroom or a collar button, the old collar button? Kind of the same idea. Break through Brooks membrane. Right, right. It breaks through Brooks and it kind of squeezes it. It's sort of like toothpaste kind of being you know, squeezed through a small aperture. It kind of just breaks through Brooks and it just, the cells just sort of bulge out. I've even seen this acutely. I've seen a couple of lesions I follow. They're like a nevoma. We're kind of watching. And all of a sudden they'll come back and they're just, they, they've grown tremendously. They just, they suddenly doubled in size, tripled in size. You get real worried. What's is this lesion just taken off? What's happened is it's broken through Brooks and just sort of, again, there's a squeezed out. It just, it, it bulges out because of that sudden breakthrough Brooks. So it's not that the lesion has grown so rapidly and so much bigger. It's just that it's broken through Brooks and just suddenly starts to kind of just bulge out, kind of protrude. So that's that mushroom concept. So again, uh, it's when you see that, it's, it's very helpful. It's, most lesions don't do that. I've seen a few metastatic lesions that did mushroom, so it's not 100%. But if you don't see it, it isn't all that helpful because a lot of melanomas don't mushroom. They're not big enough. They haven't broken through Brooks yet, so it isn't uh, you know hang your hat kind of situation. But you know, again, if you see it, it's helpful to see that. Here's a patient I saw years ago. He's kind of an old sheep herder kind of guy, just really hated doctors. And his wife dragged him in, kicking and screaming. And for he had, you know, he complained about a shadow in his vision. So he had this small lesion here, a little bit of uh, vitreous opacities. So I thought it was probably a nevoma. You know, let's watch it. Let's bring it back in, in uh, three or four months and check it again. He came back three years later, and the lesion looked like this. So definitely you know, looking more melanoma-like, broken through Brooks, subretinal fluid. So we're starting, you know, we need to send you to the oncologist, think about a plaque. Uh, no way, he was just resistant to anything. I was, you know, just wife kind of rolled her eyes and he just wasn't gonna you know, do anything. So I uh, said, so let's get you back then another couple of months, check it again. Came back two years later, looks like this, you know, just doubled in size, you know, obviously melanoma is the point now where you, you probably can't put a plaque on it. Most, uh, uh, our oncologist probably beyond eight millimeters in thickness. Uh, they won't plaque them because you just you can't kill all the tumor and morbidity to the eye is so high that you just cause a lot of destruction of surrounding retina. So uh, probably a nucleation would be you know the thought in a case like this. But again, he was just no way he was going to do that. And this is showing the A scan by the way. I forgot to show this. So here initially here was the nevoma, kind of this lower area, high area getting bigger here, getting more homogeneous. Here's this big lesion here with a lot of interfaces, a lot of hemorrhage inside necrosis, but you get more of the reflectivity here. You go through the lesion. Came back another year later, as I was very painful, <clears throat> pressure of 60, uh, rubiosis, you know, just this is all tumor, just fills the eye. <clears throat> and he just insisted it was sinus. He said, no, I'm, if my sinus says I need antibiotics. I said, well, so no, it's your tumor. It's gotten so big as, you know, he just wouldn't listen, took off, went somewhere else. Here's the tumor here on A-scan. Here's the surface. Here's the sclera. So just eyeful the tumor. And then he was in the obituary six months later, metastatic melanoma. So it's just a natural course of a lesion that it just evolves, you know, naturally. So again, if he'd been plaqued here at this point, a good chance he could have you know, saved his life, even saved the eye. So 
That's the natural history of melanomas. Here's the ample of, of treatment. This is a patient uh, with the melanoma here. Here's the tumor, here's the sclera, here's the mushrooming lesion. This is after radiation. So the lesion shrinks and also becomes more irregular internally because of necrosis, edema, you get different interfaces. So instead of being homogeneous and regular, you get more heterogeneous up and down. And here's the B scan. So um, we see a lot of these or you know, a lot of plaques are being put on both by Dr. Hansen and also several groups here in town do uh, iodine plaques. So that's pretty much standard of care. Occasionally they'll have proton beam radiation, which is not available here. Huntsman has a proton beam, but it's not set up for eyes at this point. You have to have special markers and special uh, software and things. So they haven't done that yet. Hopefully it'll be done. But uh, they send them to San Francisco, Devron Char, back to Massachusetts, Pioneer. So this is what happens when they're treated. And paradoxically, if you treat a melanoma with radiation, um, if it gets small fast, if it really shrinks down rapidly, that's actually a worse prognostic uh, situation than if it's more slow. And the thought is because these are more aggressive tumors, they're uh, higher risk for metastases, uh, they shrink fast because they're more aggressive tumors, but then they have a higher chance of recurrence or metastasizing. So you, you kind of want slow gradual shrinkage over a couple of years of these tumors after radiation. Okay, extraskeletal extension of a melanoma. Any thoughts on that? What you'd worry about if you thought a tumor was extending beyond the sclera? Here's a lesion here, here's the A scan, here's the surface, here's the sclera. You can see that in the A scan after the sclera, there is some uh, low, low reflectivity, especially on the lower left image. And then on the B scan, you can also see that acoustic hollowness after the sclera to posterior to it. All right, very good. So here's that he's talking about. So here's the sclera here, and here's the orbital component of it. So you're actually got a lesion just right behind the, uh, the tumor in the orbit. And the A scan here, here's the, here's the uh, posterior sclera, and here's, here's the lesion here inside the sclera. So this is, this is an obvious one. If you saw this, you'd worry about extraskeletal extension. So sometimes it's not that obvious. Um, here's a lesion that we were following. Here's kind of a nevoma. Here's the lesion here. Here's a couple of years later. Hadn't changed all that much on the uh, clinical exam, but yet on the A and, A and B scan, it showed a large lesion. So here's the lesion here in the, in the globe. Here's the orbital component. Here's the lesion here. Here's the orbit. And here's the CT scan showing the lesion here is not, not a huge lesion, but just you know, broken through and gone into the orbit. So you worry about that. You, when you do the ultrasound, um, if you see kind of the sclera, kind of just kind of ratty looking or irregular looking, and you see something behind it, you always got to suspect uh, extraskeletal extension. Here's a case that we published a while ago, Brad Jacobson was involved with this, where here was a lesion here at the VA and I didn't see any evidence of extraskeletal extension. I thought it, the sclera looked intact, nothing in the orbit, but it had an MRI scan for some reason, and it showed this little area here, and they called it uh, extraskeletal extension uh, on the report. We actually went down and looked at them with the radiologist, got several involved, and they all thought, yeah, that's just suspicious for extraskeletal extension, but it turned out not to be. The eyes are nucleated, and the sclera was intact, and pathologically, uh, it did not extend beyond it. So ultrasound can be pretty helpful in these cases, you know, just really. And then here's one that uh, breaking through, here's that echolucency behind the lesion. Here it is here. So again, if you see that, it's not always extension. Sometimes inflammation can do that. A rapidly growing tumor can cause inflammation of this, you know, like a posterior scoritis. sub t can get thickened because of that. So it's not 100%, but you got to be suspicious. If you see that, you got to alert the uh, oncologist to it. And, uh, if you put a plaque on, if you had extraskeletal extension, that could be a cause of dissemination if you start messing with the tumor in that area. So you want to kind of know ahead of time. So I, you get other studies, you'd want to you know, look at it with MRIs and look at the lesion. So metastatic risk, 
about 40, 50 percent of melanoma is metastasized the liver within 10 years. <clears throat> and unfortunately, our statistics across the board, melanomas, all melanomas taken together, big, small, whatever, is still about 50 percent mortality risk over 10 to 20 years. And that's been the case for 50, 60 years. So we, in spite of all of our things we do now, we haven't really moved that, that uh, lever very much on olamid metastasis, metastatic risk. Certainly small lesions, you know, saving the globe, things like that are important and makes a difference, but we still have to address for us probably just catching these early, you know, catching the ones that are nevi transforming to melanomas. That's where we got to really uh, stress our, our efforts. A lot of publications about uh, risk factors, both chromosomal, monosomy three is a high risk factor for metastases. AQ gain, AP loss, 1P deletion, 16Q deletion, these are all things on chromosomes that increase metastatic risk. So to do a needle biopsy, to look at these cytologically, and uh, Dr. Hansen is sort of taught working with cytology to, to do these kinds of things. Genetics, there's a 15 gene array uh, series that some people are using. Class one, uh, low metastatic risk. Class two, including the BAP1, high risk metastases. So once these metastasize, they really, you can't do much. Uh, there's a lot of work now with skin melanomas. Uh, Jimmy Carter, former President Carter, had metastatic melanoma to the brain, I think over 10 years ago now. And with uh, checkpoint inhibitors and other treatments, he's still alive, teaching Sunday school in Georgia and building houses with habitat for humanity. So uh, that's, they're making progress with cutaneous melanoma. But unfortunately, choroidal melanomas are a different animal for some reason, and they just don't respond to those things at this point. So we'll hopefully get better. But so at least for a patient to give them an idea of metastatic risk, you know, if they want to know, sometimes they don't, but uh, you can tell them it's low or it's high. So that can be helpful. Okay, calcification inside the globe. What are some things that can cause calcification? Any thoughts on that? Renoblastoma. Okay, for sure. Like the case earlier, osteomas. Okay, osteoma, right. Tuberous sclerosis. Okay. Jerusalem. Okay, good. So what do you think this is? So here's the globe here. Here's the lesion, calcium. I would drop lungs. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> is that a is that a resident case? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, actually, it's it's a lens, but it's not dropped. You would think that it is, but if you put the probe really peripherally, if you go temporally with the B scan probe and angle it towards the front, you'll pick the edge of the lens up. I see this all the time. And I've had cases referred to me that you know, they were sure as tumor, you know, and talking about treatment, but it's just an artifact of pro position. And this is really unique because this is calcified. It's a calcified lens. You can see the lens here. It's just, you know, it's probably traumatic and just they tend to calcify over time. And this looks like a tumor, but it's actually a lens and it wasn't even a drop lens. So, so that can do it. That's unusual. Okay. This case here, so here's a tumor here, but there's something in the vitreous that's bright. So what is this? Any astronomers in the group? Asteroid. Asteroid hylosis. Asteroid hylosis. So that can be a finding. Usually it's unilateral, sometimes chronic, you know, vitreous changes, diabetics, but sometimes it just happens for no reason. But you get a little this you know, B scan, you get a lot of reflectivity here in the vitreous, and the A scan, just all these spikes. The amazing thing about asteroid hylosis is, you know, here's how dense it is. You can hardly see the fundus. You know, you just imagine this patient must be 2200 or so. They're often like 2030, you know, 2040. I mean, how does that work? So that's been studied and looked at. And if anybody wants to be famous in the literature, figure that out. Tell us why. But uh, asteroid hylosis. Okay, you talked about drusen. So 
you know, sometimes it's obvious you can see they're actually looking at the fundus, but sometimes not so much. A lot of pseudopapilledema, I'm referred to probably a case a week that's, you know, rule out papilledema. Uh, young teenager with headaches, common scenario, and they look at the disc and it looks blurred, so they get all nervous. And if they're lucky, they <clears throat> send them to ultrasound first and for 200 bucks and five minutes, you can make the diagnosis. The other way is to go to neurology, MRI, CT, uh, spinal tap, angiogram before they make the diagnosis. So uh, Drew can certainly uh, fool you. Any rough idea in the population how common drusen are? How many people have optic nerve drusen just out of a hundred people? Any wild guesses? Eleven percent. Okay, good guess. It's about two to three, two to three percent. So you know, fairly low. Um, and there's a genetic component, it's probably kind of a mixed penetrance, probably autosomal dominant, but um, <clears throat> a lot of people with Drusen have a family history of it or somebody in the family. That Brad Katz and I years ago did a study. We used to haul our equipment out to family reunions. I take my ultrasound machine and he, we draw blood and try to find the gene. Uh, never found it yet, so we're still working on it. But in the family, if somebody has Drusen somewhere in the family, about 50% of your time time you'll find somebody else, might be a cousin, an uncle, or whatever. So they tend to run in families. Okay, so here's Drew's in here. So here's the optic nerve coming in. This is on a Doppler study, but here's the bright here. But this is a patient with a central retinal artery occlusion. And I've told the residents a number of times, if you see that, just stick the B-scan probe on. It takes 10 seconds, you can look. If you see something like that behind the, the, the Lamina carbosa, that's very suspicious for embolus. So if you have, you know, your five o'clock patient comes in and they have sudden loss of vision, they got a central artery occlusion, branch artery. If you see that right away, you know it's embolic. So you kind of ruled out uh, giant cell arteritis, other things you can, you know, do the, the embolic kind of workup. So that's a very helpful little thing to do. It just takes a, a few seconds to do that. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so I mentioned retinoblastoma. So here's the tumor here, calcium, just brightness here is calcium, a lot of calcium here, so they tend to have diffuse calcification. But not 100%, the literature varies, but they say five to 10% of retinoblastomas are non-calcified. So it's not, you know, if it, we always look for it, that's something we always, if we find calcium, that's almost always retinoblastoma. But if it's not there, it still could be. So a mass in a child is always retinoblastoma until proven otherwise. But calcium is something very important to look for. And again, here's a shadowing. There's dense calcium here. You see kind of like it's breaking through the sclera. That's not really a scleral defect. It's just shadowing from the calcium that blocks the ultrasound. Okay, what's this situation? Just looking at them. So clinically, if you saw that eye, what would you say? Just looking, first glance. Tysis bulbi? Yeah, tysis. So tyscal eyes tend to calcify. Not quite sure why that is, but you get this diffuse choroidal calcification, kind of linear right along the choroid. So here's the eye, very small eye, you know, microphthalmic. And then you get this calcification. So that's common with tysis. We talked about this case before. This is that osteoma. So here's the calcium here. Here's the lesion. And Dr. Van Dyck, who was the initial chairman of the ophthalmology department before Randy came, published this case. In those days, they used to use a test called P32. They do a radioactive tracer. They would inject it. Then they would you know, examine for it in the body. And this lesion looked like this. It took up uh, P32. So they nucleated it thinking it was a melanoma. And that's the first reported path case of a choroidal osteoma. Dr. Harry, could yes. you ultrasound to differentiate between meningioma and glioma for optic nerve with calcifications for meningioma nerve sheath? 
That's a good question. And the answer is ultrasound is not very good for that. Um, there's other things like it's, it's good for as far as bioma, meningioma, but the calcium part of it is just, I guess the orbit is just so high reflective in general, it kind of gets lost in that. So their CT scan is much better. So yeah, but good question. Okay, this lesion here, kind of a peripheral kind of granuloma with this kind of a vitreous uh, membrane kind of going across the globe. Any immediate pattern recognition thoughts to what this could be? Either clinically or by ultrasound. Okay, Toxocara. That's kind of a classic Kosakara kind of finding for some reason, like these peripheral granulomas, and they get this kind of a vitreous, sometimes retinal fold going towards the disc. So that's Toxicara, and they can, again, they can calcify. Okay, and somebody mentioned uh, astrocytoma, supersclerosis, things like that, these astrosomal kind of lesions. It looks like this kind of this funny kind of a mulberry uh, kind of a looking lesion. You see that in a patient. And then it's calcified on the ultrasound. You want to do systemic workup, obviously, looking for neurofibromatosis, supersclerosis, those kinds of things. And not uncommonly, we'll see dystrophic calcification. This is just this kind of yellowish, kind of a vague lesion here. Um, and here's the calcification, kind of this choroidal calcification. When I see this, I always look in the other eye. It's often missed. It's often more subtle, but it's almost always bilateral. So if you see this kind of superiorly temporally, kind of the insertion of the superior oblique muscle area, uh, that's called dystrophic calcification, idiopathic. Uh, here's another example of this is bilateral. Here's the right eye. Here's the left eye. So what causes this? We, that's why it's called dystrophic idiopathic because we don't know. Occasionally, it's, reduced, it's due to uh, calcium problems systemically. So I always suggest they do a you know, serum calcium, serum phosphorus. So sometimes parathyroid dysfunction. Occasionally, things like uh, amyloidosis, you get this calcification of tissue for some reason. So, but usually it's benign. It's just an incidental finding. So that's calcification of the globe. So just a lot of things you'll see. But, can cause calcification. Again, ultrasound is very helpful. It's just very sensitive to calcification. So that's why it's a good test to do. Okay, so great, great job on those questions. I appreciate your response and, and looking those up and thinking about them. I think that'll help you down the road to thinking about things, you know, instead of just rote, you know, responses, you kind of think of the, the logic behind it, the pathology, the correlation. That's where ultrasound is very helpful. So ultrasound basically is defined as sound above the range of human hearing. So we can hear up to about 20 kilohertz. Dogs are 40, whales, dolphins, 70, bats, 150. So we're kind of limited in what we can hear and also what we can see. Our part of the visual spectrum is really pretty low as far as you know, light uh, sensitivity. Medical ultrasound, abdominal, they tend to use lower frequencies, one to five. <clears throat> And megahertz. We use 8 to eight 60 with our UBMs. We can do that because the eye is small and it's full of fluids, so sound gets through it easily. We can use high frequency, better resolution. Abdominal, you can't get very far in tissue if you increase the frequency, so you have to stay in the low side. So you get less resolution, but you get better penetration. Being perpendicular is important. You kind of angle your probe as kind of a hand-eye contact. Like you're learning FACO, you do hand-eye. You know, you practice that. Same with ultrasound. You kind of move the probe, little micro-movements, kind of get perpendicular. Um, it's important because you can make misdiagnoses if you're not. Here's a lesion here. This is a nevoma. Here's a surface. Here's a sclera. This is perpendicular. You get a nice high spike. The initial, this spike here is high. It's almost as high as those spikes, even, regular. I had the same lesion. I kind of purposely made the probe oblique. And here you don't get that high spike. Internally, you get this, you would call this probably high reflectivity, irregular compared to this where it's lower, more irregular. So you can get deceived if you're not perpendicular. So just like axial length measurements, it's important to be perpendicular. Sound velocity, different tissues are correlated to density of tissue. The sound goes faster through 
low density like water, slow, uh, faster through like bone. Impedance is defined as sound velocity times density. So the faster the sound velocity, the greater the density, the greater the impedance. And the major principle of ultrasound is difference in impedance. You have sound going through one tissue, then to another, like through the vitreous and through a melanoma. That interface between those two is this impedance difference. And that's where you get the reflection of sound. And the greater the difference, the higher the reflectivity. So the higher the A scan spike, the brighter the B scan uh, spike. And here's the B scan we talked about. And a lot of machines that you buy will have kind of a combined A and B scan on the same machine. If you push a button, you can take the B scan signal, make it into an A scan signal, but it's not the same as the separate A scan. This is what I use. It's a, it's a separate dedicated A scan probe, and it's just more reliable. The B scan, A scan combination is just less reliable for sound uh, the, uh, diagnosis based on reflectivity patterns. Dr. Harry, I have a question. On yes, the, sure. So is it the absolute difference? So either going from high to low, low to high, that causes that big spike, or does it depend on which way the impedance is going? I mean, as far as the, like, you mean here? Yeah, so say the peak. Like if it's going from a very high impedance to a low impedance right. versus right. going from low to high. Yeah, either way, it's, it's a difference. So, you know, obviously here, you have more homogeneous with the vitreous, you know, low, low interfaces. Whereas here, you get a, you know, this change, even though it's still on the lower side, it's still got interfaces. So that difference in, in sound velocity and tissue density is what causes a spike. Okay, so it doesn't so, matter which way it's, it's no, going. Just either way, you go from okay. low to high or high to low. This is, that's that difference that causes that spike. In fact, here's an example here. So you're going from low here, to higher here with a spike, you're going from lower here to higher here with a spike. This is the orbit here. So again, you just show that, you know, it's either way, you're gonna get that, that spike. So I did a study, looked at a thousand patients years ago and just to sort of see, you know, how am I helpful and is ultrasound making the difference? So patients referred to me for ultrasound for whatever reason, you know, a fundus lesion, a rule out detached red and a vitreous hemorrhage. The clinical impression of the doctor was confirmed in 400 plus cases of these. I couldn't find uh, something in almost 300. And that meant like it's often eye pain. Um, doctor, my eye hurts. You know, we'll see those all the time in clinic. I do the ultrasound. I really couldn't find a reason. You know, there's no echographic basis. Not that there isn't. It's just I couldn't find it. Uh, clinical impression clarified or altered in over 300. So these are cases where the patient was sent in maybe for a vitreous hemorrhage and I found a detached retina, or sent in for a nevus and I found a melanoma. So, uh, you know, at least a third or so, um, it really made a big impact on the, on the care of the patient. And I was wrong in five cases that mostly orbital lesions and, uh, were biopsy proven to be something else but about a third had pathology that weren't suspected. So that's important to keep in mind. So that's the value of ultrasound to really be helpful in these cases. Indications for ultrasound, opaque media, visible lesions, biometry, axial length, measurement of structures, tumors after treatment, et cetera, vitro pathology, and optic disc. So these are all things that really, I think ultrasound has a real important role in. So the blind painful eye, a uh, patient comes in your practice, you know, and they just have this red eye and this, like I saw in triage clinic two days ago, uh, very painful, just, you know, Hispanic gentleman, Ill, uh, illegal alien and uh, had a blind painful eye, history of diabetes, but really kind of a sketchy history, poor medical follow-up. So, you know, what's going on here? And this is critical to do an ultrasound to find out what's inside the eye. The past studies from Zimmerman years ago were, 10% of these will harbor unsuspected melanomas. So you definitely have to do uh, you know, ultrasound. As a little side pearl too, in a patient like this with a blind painful eye, that's just, you know, really, is, you look, you do the ultrasound, it's just maybe total attached retina, chronic detachment, probably not surgically repairable. What would you do in this situation clinically? 
for this patient, for getting ultrasound for a minute. You're the doctor, you're in charge. Uh, this patient's suffering, they can't sleep at night. They have really no insurance or minimal insurance. What is your solution to this patient's problem? You know, pressure's real high, it's 80, cloudy cornea. Anything you do clinically? Um, well, if they have like a lot of band keratopathy, you could do um, sometimes a bandage contact lens um, and sometimes atropine can help okay. with these eyes just if there's a lot of, <clears throat> but if they're pre and um, I don't know, there's not a lot you can do if, unless, you know, uh, sparing them surgery. All right. Those are good points. You know, bandage contact lens, if you see a lot of corneal irregularity. Um, try to get the pressure down, drops, but usually these are, you know, rubiosis, neovascular glaucoma, so really drops just aren't going to do much. Um, so those kinds of things you would try, but generally it's not going to be very helpful. So nucleation obviously is a solution, but a little trick I found over the years keeps us in the back of your mind. So I used to do alcohol blocks. We'd actually inject absolute alcohol retrovulvarly, and that would kill nerve fibers and things and reduce the pain. It also causes lots of inflammation. They go through a period that really inflamed and painful and miserable. But Thorazine or Promazine has been found to be useful in these situations. And I've done that a number of times in my clinical practice, you know, blind painful eyes that didn't want to be nucleated, couldn't afford it, whatever reason. Um, this injection of this, 0.5%, um, can help the pain. So just keep that in mind as a little pearl or trick in your practice someday. Okay, fundus lesions. Um, again, we show those studies, the 20% false positive. So just looking at these clinically, you know, indirect ophthalmos, scope, uh, fluorescein angiography, whatever, we're still wrong about 20% of the time. We really can't tell what these are. So ultrasound can be very helpful in these kinds of lesions. Biometry, you know, we use IL master all the time, light based, but um, you know, probably five, 10% are getting better with software improvements, but still there are certain cataracts you just can't get good biometry. So I'm sent probably a case a week or they couldn't get measurements. Uh, so we'll do uh, axial length uh, immersion ultrasound. And uh, so here's the spike from the probe. Here's the cornea, double peak cornea lens and retina. So axial length is important. Vitreal retinal pathology, um, Here's a vitreous membrane with kind of this hammock or tabletop retinal detachment, kind of a focal, kind of a characteristic diabetic kind of situation. Optic nerve drusen, the value of that with looking for you know, calcium deposits behind the nerve. Now, one interesting thing with ultrasound, I can't de uh, detect a drusen unless it's calcified. So you always have these, like a kid sent in, you know, they got funny looking nerves. Uh, Griffin will send me a case or Bob Hoffman or the other pediatric folks. And is this, you know, is this papilledema? Is it drusen? The youngest I've seen with calcified drusen is four years old. And I look at the literature, that's the youngest I've seen reported too. So under four or five, yeah, it's really ultrasound, not going to really help you that much as far as trying to find, you know, calcification. And there's OCT kind of goes back and forth. Some people claim this is good or better than ultrasound, others that it's not. So, so I know calcium, if I see that, then it's just for sure. So, uh, so we're still trying to work out if we can find other ways to detect these before they calcify any younger patient. Doppler effects, um, based on the Doppler phenomenon, astronomers use that for the redshift for the big bang, you know, galaxy explosion. So this is the color Doppler of an eye. Here's the back of the eye, behind the eye. So this is the ophthalmic artery here, central retina artery, ciliary vessels here supplying the choroid. This is a normal looking color Doppler. Here's a uh, branch artery occlusion. So this part is just gone. There's no blood flow through here. Whereas right you get it on this side. Here's a giant cell arteritis. And this is why giant cell is so devastating. Once you lose vision from giant cell, it's pretty well gone. You 
high dose steroids, you try to save the other eye, but you're just not gonna get, get this back. This is just all dead. There's just no blood flow here at all. That's why it's so devastating to have a, you know, artery occlusion from giant cell. So always keep that in mind. Always suspect giant cell, patient walks in, any kind of an artery occlusion, you know, unless they're 20 years old and no symptoms, I wouldn't, you know, worry about it. But yeah, anybody kind of past middle age, uh, always get set array, CRP, always rule out uh, giant cell. That's pretty critical. Uh, fistulas, uh, kind of a red eye, kind of these corkscrew vessels, kind of tortuous vessels. Sometimes patients complain about hearing their pulse in their head at night, hearing the brewery. Sometimes you can hear it with your stethoscope. Sometimes you can't. But here's a color Doppler showing the, uh, the enlarged superior ophthalmic vein with uh, blood flow. So usually it's blue because of venous, but here it's red because of arterial flow. So you get a fistula. And we're doing the study with the color Doppler on the temporal arteries. That's still ongoing. Got about 30 plus patients now. And so far we're looking pretty good as far as correlation. As our rounds a while ago, Nick Mamala said that about 5% of our biopsies here are positive and that's been our correlation on, on, the, on the Doppler. So this is a normal temporal artery here. Here's called a halo sign. See this echolucency around the vessel. That's due to vessel wall inflammation. So it's because they're inflamed, they get this edema around them. So here's on the uh, long section, here's the cross section. So this halo sign. Um, the one problem with this is it disappears real fast. They start steroids, this goes away. I'm trying to find out how fast, whether it's a day or longer. Um, but if they're on, you know, once they're on steroids, it probably isn't gonna be your helpful to get the color Doppler if it's been more than a day or so. So just keep that in mind, but we appreciate any patients you see to let us know about it and we'll do the ultrasound. Immersion techniques, when I trained at UCLA, this is the old way we used to do it. We used to drape the patient's face, fill this full of water, you know, drown them, they hated it, they were claustrophobic. But now we use immersion techniques. We use scleral shells, little tonal tip covers and things. But here's an immersion scan of a, a ciliary body cyst, iris cyst. So here's just a regular 10 megahertz B scan, the same lesion here in a 20 megahertz and a 50. It just shows a resolution just goes up with the increase in frequency. You see these nice cysts that are just really obviously there and that's very helpful. Uh, UBM here, this is a case of chronic endophthalmitis or chronic uveitis after cataract surgery, even a year. This wasn't getting better, no response to antibiotics. Steroids have kind of get better, then get, get worse again. But here's the ultrasound, here's the iris up here. Here's the, here's the lens uh, optic. This little clump here is actually vegetation of P. acnes, bacteria growing there. We can actually see it with the ultrasound and they had to go in and take the lens and the bag out just to finally cure the patient. A lot of bug syndrome. I see these probably at least once or twice a week. Here's a lens haptic kind of as you go towards the periphery, the haptics actually touching the back of the iris, the ciliary body area. This patient had chronic recurrent hyphema, increased pressure. So UG stands for uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema. So any of these uh, can be caused by this. So that's something to always look for with ultrasound. Here's a correlation. This is an article by Shields showing the OCT versus ultrasound. So with a lesion anterior to the iris, they're probably comparable. Here's a lesion on OCT, here it is on UBM. But behind the iris, then you can't see the lesion. This is a light-based technology here with OCT. So the iris blocks it. So the ultrasound can get back there and show you lesions behind the iris. So that's why ultrasound is really helpful. Ciliary body, posterior behind the iris, ultrasound is, is, is the best test for that. Okay, this patient, here's an ultrasound of a patient that has some symptoms. Uh, dysphotopsia, which after cataract surgery is not uncommon. I'm sure in your practice, all of you will see this. You'll do a cataract surgery, everything goes great. You know, FACO, beautiful. Flip the implant in, just in the bag. And the patient's complaining bitterly about dysphotopsia. They see flashes of light, they see shimmering, they see whatever we want to, whatever symptoms are, but... Uh, and sometimes you can't find a reason. In this case, it's obvious this lens is uh, displaced, probably kind of crimped haptic or something. They have maybe one haptic in the bag, one haptic out, but it's decentered. And this patient really had a lot of symptoms, just really unhappy, 
So sometimes it looks normal. I do the old stand and it's well placed, it's centered, it's in the bag. So something the nature of lens implants, just with you know, refraction of light or whatever, they're going to get these symptoms and they'll drive you crazy. Uh, they'll just come back repeatedly and just very unhappy. So the only option sometimes is to replace the implant, but um, sometimes the same problem occurs with a different implant. So it's just one of those things we're still kind of agonizing about. Uh, this case I saw recently was in uh, surgery, uh, Marfan's uh, child, and the lens has been dislocated into the vitreous here. So the cornea is up here. Here's the lens sitting there in mid vitreous. And David Rees was doing the case. This is his patient. And he was really worried about this kid that, you know, the, had cataract, you know, Marfan's eye, what are you going to do? Kind of a corneal opacities. But he saw the lens here. He was all excited because the lens now had displaced out of the visual axis. Here's the visual axis here. So he could do a retina scope and he could actually refract the kid. It's like plus 15, but he could prescribe glasses for the kid because the lens is out of, out of the way here. So interesting case here of lens dislocation. Dr. Harry. Yes. Um, can you diagnose like in the bag UG or like any type of like a dynamic um, B scan? Yeah, to determine if there's any like zonular laxity. Right, good question. Uh, you know, the zonules, I can sometimes see a zonule with a BUBM, but it's not, you know, I can't really say there's loose zonules or missing zonules, but you're right. By having the patient move to different positions, I'll have them move the head side to side or even sit up and kind of bend forward. If I see lens displacement, I've seen several cases of that where the lens seemed to be okay, but then by positioning, you would get different uh, you know, the lens position in different positions. So a good question. So I do dynamic sometimes. Uh, orbital echography, I think we're getting kind of low on time here, so I won't spend a lot of time in this, but just the incredible imaging technology. When I was an intern back at UCLA a long time ago in the 70s, we had our plain film x-rays. So imagine trying to diagnose all these things with just an x-ray. So CTs had just come along kind of late 70s and then MRI followed and PET scans. My son's a PGY2 radiology resident in Denver. So he's just seeing things I never even dreamed of as a, as a resident. But again, the correlation and pathology with uh, ultrasound uh, pattern recognition. So A scan of the orbit, here's with normal orbit. So you get this high reflectivity kind of regular Here's hemangioma with this up and down. We talked about the hemangioma of the, of the choroid. Here's a uh, mixed cell tumor. Here's a swanoma. Here's a lymphoma. So again, even though these funny spikes look weird, there is a correlation to pathology. So that's why it really is, could be helpful. Again, pattern recognition and different things. Indications for B-scan. We talked about a lot of this, the drusen. Uh, retro bulbar, I see patients often referred with a lot of eye pain. They have like an anterior scleritis and um, I'll pick a posterior scleritis. We always look for that on these cases and see if we can see anything in the subtenons, thickening, scleral thickening, consistent with posterior scleritis. We saw a case I was involved with a couple of years ago. It's a recurrent hyphema. I've been seen on the outside for this child, like two-year-old that keep having bleeding in the iris. Question was, was it like a xanthogranuloma or something? So we're going to go to surgery and do a EUA and look at the UBM. I didn't see much on the UBM, but just while I was there, I stuck the probe on there. Here's a big orbital mass. So the kid's asleep, a two-year-old orbital mass, abdominal examination. They thought I was crazy. I suggested the anesthesiologist just take the abdomen. He had a mass in the abdomen. It was a neuroblastoma, metastatic. So keep that in mind. So this was, again, where B-scan was helpful to show a mass that hadn't been suspected preoperatively. Uh, superior ophthalmic vein, if you see these fistulas, without Doppler, you can still see these on a regular B-scan, but you can't tell, is this a fistula or just, just kind of a, a uh, occluded you know, vein? Is it, is it clotted off and just the vein is expanded, but there's not active blood flow? That's where Doppler can be helpful. Here's again, here's the case of the central artery occlusion. You get the cherry red spot, macular edema. Uh, paramacular, and then you get this brightness here, which is consistent with embolus. About 30% of these will have uh, embolus diagnosable by B scan. So again, just a quick, easy test to do. A scan in the orbits, uh, paraocular. Uh, here's a, a lacrimal tumor, mixed cell with characteristic pattern, pretty diagnostic with mixed cell. 
optic nerve evaluation. Somebody asked about this. So here is the optic nerve on B scan. This is the A scan. So this is actually a widened nerve, this spike there, spike there. This is called the 30 degree test. I had the patient abduct the eye 30 degrees and the nerve actually gets smaller. That's because this is a case of pseudotumor cerebri increasing the cradle pressure where the nerve sheath fluid as you have the eye abducted, it kind of thins out and the nerve gets smaller. So this is a good test to rule out uh, optic nerve edema um, due to like pseudotumor. Muscle exams, um, using the A scan to look at the muscle from this tendon back to the muscle belly. Sinus disease, I pick up sinus disease, not uncommonly, you see these spikes coming. So this is the globe here, oops. Here's the, uh, the normal orbit. Usually you don't see spikes from the sinus because it's air filled, air blocks ultrasounds, you get nothing. But if you see a lot of spikes like this, that's very consistent with sinus disease. I picked up a lot of ethmoid frontal sinus disease. So you can sort of direct the work up there appropriately. Uh, tumors, there's a hemangioma causing a disc edema in this kid with a hemangioma. Um, Baby, they thought had orbital cellulitis, you know, this swollen lid, this was the old generation of CT scan, kind of amorphous, not very specific or something in the orbit, but what is it? Could that be abscess? Could it be a tumor? And this is the DOP, the uh, ultrasound. So it's this kind of low area, high area. These infantile hemangiomas tend to be kind of heterogeneous. And this blur here is due to vascularity. And I actually use this little uh, OB Doppler. I'll put it right against the lesion. I listen for blood flow. And here is an example. So do you hear that? That's uh, consistent with hemangioma. So we see probably uh, a case of a month or so of that. Here's a kid with a AV uh, malformation. Uh, the lesion on the uh, CT scan, but by Valsalva, it went from this to this. So just as you bend forward, have them bear down, increase the size of the lesion. Lymphangiomas, they can uh, bleed into the cell spontaneously and get real big real fast, but you get these multi-cystic areas on the B scan, also the A scan. Uh, uh, Rhabdomyosarcoma, classic history, 10-year-old boy playing wiffle ball, just a ball hit his eye, kind of a soft, you know, soft ball, it wasn't really that hard. But a week later, because he had an eye with uh, proptosis, uh, chemosis, and on the uh, ultrasound had a low reflectivity, very cellular, very densely cellular. Here's the B scan. So rhabdomyosarcoma, minor trauma. Always keep that in mind in a child with a proptosis or orbital lesion. Check out the muscles. Ultrasound is very helpful. A lot of Graves disease these patients. We see rule out Graves. You know, the spectrum of Graves' disease, simple hyperthyroidism to malignant exophthalmus. Um, spectrum of eye disease, so overactive, I kind of characterize it. Lid lag, widened fissure, lid retraction stare, that can just be hyperthyroidism. But once you get the orbital findings called congestive, chemosis, hyperemia, muscle dysfunction, proptosis, so the spectrum, sometimes there's a, you know, kind of both. Some patients have both of these going on. About 40% of patients with Graves get thyroid eye disease. 90% with thyroid eye disease have Graves thyroid. And it's not always, uh, the test doesn't always help you because about 6% can be youth thyroid. This is the uh, kind of the time spectral. About 25% of patients will actually present with Graves orbitopathy before the thyroid test become abnormal. So a lot of these can still fool you. The internists always have a you know, battle with us, is this Graves disease or not, because the thyroid tests are normal. Yet, if you watch them over time, most of these eventually become abnormal with their thyroid test. And looking at muscles, here's normal muscle with the A scan showing the reflectivity patterns, kind of you know, high reflective, a little bit irregular, but more homogeneous. Here's Graves disease, you get a lot of edema, inflammation, so you get more internal reflectivity, uh, heterogeneity. You got bigger muscles, different interfaces. Uh, and large muscles, these are all causes of big muscles. Graves is the most common board question. Most common cause of unilater unilateral proptosis, Graves disease. Most common cause of bilateral proptosis, Graves disease. So uh, very common in the population. Myositis, 
infectious, other causes of big muscles. And I think I asked a question, I, because of time, we'll just answer this real quickly. So uh, myositis versus uh, other kind of muscle. Usually the myositis is uh, usually isolated, unilateral, but they can sometimes be uh, multiple muscles. Thickened tendon is a big differentiation. Grays tend to have normal tendon thickness. Myositis tends to be thicker. Uh, regularity on A scan more on the myositis more low, more regular because of dense infiltration of uh, inflammatory cells. Pain on movement, usually grays doesn't have this, but there can be inflammatory graves. I've seen graves present as a myositis because graves is inflammatory disease. So acute graves can kind of mimic this. You can have pain, you can have thickened tendons. So again, spectrum, not 100%. But here's the tendon on the B scan on the myositis. Here's the A scan tendon. So low reflective, thickened tendon. So here's a collage. So normal muscle here. This is graves here, so thick muscle. And here's myositis, so thick muscle, but low reflective. So you can make that differentiation. Optic nerve evaluation, we talked about the 30 degree test. Uh, it's a question about meningioma. So here's a glioma. This is a thick nerve here. The nerve sheath to sheath is thickened. And here's meningioma. You can actually see the nerve sheath thickened here and the nerve parenchyma here. But I, again, calcification, I really can't uh, tell because of the orbit. So that's it. Ultrasound in a capsule. So any burning questions or? Uh, Dr. Harry, I have a question. This yes. is something that came up on call a couple of weeks ago when um, they have the ultrasound machine that has kind of the eye um, setting on it. Uh -huh. And the physician there was wondering if we would hold the ultrasound with a normal abdominal ultrasound setting on the eye, would it do any damage? Uh, there's no proof of damage. In fact, uh, we did a we did the color Doppler studies initially, uh, not just on the temporal artery, but actually on the globe. We had to go through all kinds of, you know, uh, board review and things like that to get a, approved. But there's no proof of high frequency causing damage. So I think they're fine to use that. You know, I'm not aware of any problem. Yeah. I mean, the, the machines all have the ophthalmic setting, but it was just a question that I couldn't really answer. I wouldn't think so, but uh, yeah. I think you're fine. I think frequency is just not, you know, there's a, you know, the frequency is related to thermal energy. So if you get real high, that's why they use therapeutic ultrasound that they treat tendonitis and things with, that frequency would obviously damage the eye. But the ones we use just for diagnostic just is not a problem. So I think you're fine. Okay, thank you. Sure. And then I just had a quick question I put in the chat earlier about utility for anterior segment stuff. Sorry, I didn't um, such as like senile plaques with calcification versus like OSSN or band uh -huh. keratopathy versus other corneal lesions. So I know we have better imaging modalities and clinical um, diagnosis, but do you ever use those for anterior segment pathology or not necessarily? Um, so uh, summarize the question. I'm sorry, the question. Summarize it again. I'm not sure what you're asking. Do you use ultrasound for anterior segment, like corneal or scleral pathology, like senile plaques with calcification versus like another type of lesion? Yeah, actually I do. UBN is very helpful. I can see, you know, like a lesion, you know, you're worried about a, you know, a squamous cell or something growing onto the, from the conjunctiva to the cornea. Ultrasound, the value there is, is the depth, the penetration of the lesion. Of course, OCT can help there too, but I can actually see the plane of the invasion of the lesion, whether it goes into the globe or whether it's just, you know, stops halfway through. And also epispleritis, I see a lot of that where I put the probe on the, the UBM and I can tell if it's, ep, if it's episclera versus sclera. So it can be helpful in those situations. Mm -hmm.